and thank you to those uh, viewing remotely. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Sanchez. Here. Council Member Ibarra. Present. Council Member Figueroa. Here. Mayor Pro Tem. Here. Council Member Reynoso it will not be attending today. Council Member Kelvin. Present. Council Member Alexander. Here. And Mayor Tran. Here. Moving on to public comments for closed session. Madam City Clerk, do we have any public comments? We do not have any for Thank closed you. Session. We will now convene into closed session at 4.09 p.m. We initiated an investigation of that claim and has voted four to two to release portions of the investigative report. Council members Sanchez, Ibarra, Figueroa, and Mayor Pro Tem Charette voted yes. Council members Alexander and Kelvin voted no, and Council member Reynoso um, was absent. That's all the reportable action I have. Thank you. I now call to order to this joint regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council at 5.08 p.m. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being here, and thank you for those re viewing remotely. I call to order this joint special meeting of the Mayor and City Council and the Mayor and City Council acting as the successor agency to the redevelopment agency of the City of San Bernardino. Pastor Paul E. Jones of Independent Trinity Benjamin E. Jones Community Resource Center will lead tonight's invocation. And Melissa Gastelum from Dominguez Elementary School will lead us in Pledge of Allegiance. Please approach to the podium at this time. Please rise. As we go to the throne of grace, I just want to say good evening to the council board and our mayor. Gracious Father, we thank you today for your love and kindness, your tender mercy, oh God. Thank you how you woke us up this morning and started us on our way. Dear God, I ask you to come into this meeting upon this day. Let your will be done, oh God. This is not for no show or fashion, oh God, but your will for San Bernardino County, your will for the Congress, your will for everyone that's represented here today. God, I ask you to impart your presence upon today, oh God. We thank you and we glorify you in Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Please put your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Paul Jones, and thank you, Melissa, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Sanchez. Here. Council Member Ibarra. Present. Council Member Figueroa. Here. Mayor Pro Tem. Here. Council Member Reynoso is absent tonight. Council Member Kelvin. Present. Council Member Alexander. Here. Mayor Tran. Here. Thank you. Before we conduct city business, as a friendly reminder, as the elected leaders of the city, we will endeavor to be respectful to each other, our public, and especially our staff. Our behavior this evening sets the tone of how our residents, business community, and others view our city. We must conduct city business with professionalism and respectful behavior to build trust, credibility, and move our city forward. We shall commit to these values and foster a positive and productive working environment that is conducive to achieving our goals effectively and efficiently. We will now move on to presentations. Testing. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? No? Let me project my voice. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Um, uh, can I have our library director and library board president, Jim Pearson? Oh, it works now. Now you can hear me. Can you both come up? Come up. We have a proclamation of the Mayor and City Council proclaiming April 7th to the 13th, 2024 as National Library Week in the City of San Bernardino. Whereas in observance of National Library Week, patrons are encouraged to visit one or more of the San Bernardino public libraries either in person or virtually at www.sbpl.org. And whereas the theme for Li National Library Week 2024, Ready, Set, Library. Promotes the idea that in our always online world, libraries give us a green light to something truly special. A place to connect with others, learn new skills, and focus on what matters most. Find your crew at the library's author's talks, workshops, and book clubs. And whereas besides patrons checking out books, doing research, using a PC, or enjoying the free Wi-Fi, we offer various free activities such as preschool story time, crafts, workshops, author visits, entertainment programs, literacy services, and classes to help people improve their lives at no cost. And whereas libraries help change lives in their communities, serving people of every age, education level, ethnicity, and physical ability, and whereas our San Bernardino Public Library has served our community for 133 years, and if there is any city that can benefit from a free library, public library, it is here. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino do hereby proclaim April 7th to the 13th, 2024, as National Library Week. Council members, would you like to join me to take pictures with them? All right, next proclamation for sexual, uh, sexual Assault Awareness Month in the city of San Bernardino presented to Program Director for Partners Against Violence. Arlinda Wilson, would you like to come up? Okay, pro proclamation of the Mayor and City Council proclaiming April 2024 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in the city of San Bernardino, whereas nationally one in three women and one in four men will experience some form of sexual assault in their lifetime, highlighting the pervasive nature of this issue and the urgent need for action. And whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month draws attention to the fact that sexual violence is widespread and has implications for every community member, underscoring the importance of collective efforts to address and prevent it. And whereas there is compelling evidence that we can be successful in reducing sexual violence through prevent prevention education, increased awareness, and holding perpetrators who commit acts of violence responsible for their actions, emphasizing the power of education and accountability in combating this issue. And whereas we must work together to educate our community about what can be done to prevent sexual assault, and how to support survivors, recognizing the crucial role of education and supporting and creating a safer environment for all. And whereas anyone can be a leader in preventing and ending sexual violence, as employers, educators, parents, and friends, we all have an obligation to uphold the basic principle that every individual should be free from violence and fear, 
acknowledging and sh the shared responsibility of every community member in addressing and preventing sexual assault. And whereas Partners Against Violence, has been a steadfast advocate for survivors and a beacon of hope in our community, providing essential services and support to those affected by sexual violence. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino do hereby designate April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and recognize Partners Against Violence for their outstanding dedication, compassion, and tireless advocacy on behalf of survivors. Throughout this month and beyond, let us unite as a community to raise awareness, foster dialogue, and support survivors. And I want to also acknowledge, how long have you been in this community? Because that was really huge when you told me that. We've been in the community for 50 years. 50 years. Right here. Big round of applause. Council members, would you like to join me? One more, council members, stay with me. <laughs> okay, the next proclamations for Volunteer Appreciation Month in the City of San Bernardino, April 2024. Presented to Parks Director, Liddy Gutfield. Please come up. <laughs> and team. And animals and libraries. Commissioners, come up if you're here. Join us. Lydia, come here. All right. Proclamation of the Mayor City Council proclaiming April 2024 as Volunteer Appreciation Month in the city of San Bernardino, whereas the month of April has been designated nationally as a Volunteer Appreciation Month to recognize the hard work, dedication, and passion of volunteers and national service members throughout our nation, and whereas last year more than 60 million Americans gave their time and service to our nation, which is a testament to the compassion and generosity of the American spirit, and whereas the city of San Bernardino commemorates Volunteer Appreciation Month by recognizing and honoring its valued volunteers with the proclamation. And where San Bernardino believes that government alone cannot meet all of the, our city's needs. So we partner with businesses, faith based organizations, nonprofit organizations, foundations, and individuals who serve in city government in our community to make a difference. Whereas the city of San Bernardino is committed to encouraging volunteerism among its employees, citizens, partners, businesses, and organizations, and thanks all volunteers throughout the city of San Bernardino for their dedicated service. And now, therefore, be it resolved that, that the Mayor and City Council of the City of San Bernardino do hereby proclaim the month of April 2024 as Volunteer Appreciation Month in the City of San Bernardino and urge our residents to recognize the positive impact of volunteerism in our communities. Yay. Big round of applause. The next two presentations will, will be presented by our Parks Director, Liddy. 
Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. At this time, I would like to invite Victoria Reyna from the CPRS, that's the California Park and Recreation Society State Board, to present our first award. Good evening. My name is Victoria Reyna, Assistant Director for the City of Lancaster Parks, Arts, Recreation, and Community Services Department. And I proudly serve as the California Park and Recreation Society State Treasurer, Secretary and Treasurer for the State Board of Directors. This evening, I am here to present you, Honorable Mayor Tran, and the Parks and Recreation Department with the Creating Community for Arts and Cultural Services Award of Excellence. The CPRS Annual Awards Program celebrates outstanding examples of quality facility and park design, programming accomplishment, effective communications, community leadership, and professional successes that take place daily in our profession. Through our five award categories, we highlight the people, places, spaces, programs, and stories that make communities like the city of San Bernardino special. As one of eight in the state of California, one of eight of the state of California, <laughs> creating community for parks and art creation, cultural services awardees, the city of San Bernardino did just that with their innovative approach to the Day of the Dead celebration that was hosted this past year. Your amazing team offered a community ofrenda, allowing residents to submit photos online, creating a collaborative, meaningful space for remembrance. Leveraging technology and community engagement, this unique feature enhanced inclusivity for the community. Bilingual education banners further enriched their experience, providing cultural context to the traditional elements. In addition to the traditional elements of this cultural event, adding a car show enhanced the vibrancy and dedication to culture through unique automobile artistry. Additionally, the co collaboration with diverse agencies and public and private partnerships demonstrated the strategic resource utilization, the event's four-day duration extended participation, fostering community unity, staff witnessed firsthand the improvement of the quality of life through its celebration. This award presents a commitment to the innovation, community-driven initiatives, and cultural enrichment, making the, dead of the Day of the Dead celebration a standout and impactful experience for all. I would like to congratulate the City of San Bernardino Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Department on winning the 2023 Creating Community for Arts and Cultural Services Award of Excellence. I would, like, I would like to just say this award is a very special award. It's a unique one-of-a-kind award that was handmade by an artist through an LA-based nonprofit called Piece by Piece. Not only are you being recognized with a unique piece of artwork, CPRS is also helping people who are formerly unhoused and low income develop mar marketable skills, self-confidence, and improve quality of life. But I would be remiss if I don't mention that this award and this event wouldn't have been possible possible without April Flores Cooper for her innovative vision and creativity for awarding for this award winning event. So congratulations. It is my pleasure to present this to you, Mayor. Why don't you get everyone come up? So we'll take a picture up here. Council, would you like to join us?
That was beautiful, thank you. Next presentation um, is the presentation of California Parks and Recreation Society. Is that, did we just do that one? Nope, that's no. me, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. That's how we you do go, here Liddy. in San Bernardino. <laughs> All right, super excited. Um, one of the award categories that uh, you can apply for with California Parks and Recreation Society is the Community Champion Award. I wanna give you guys an understanding that there was a total of 109 applications total for the awards categories. There was five total categories. And our community champion, Terry Boykins of Project Fighting Chance was one of three in the state selected. Sorry, Terry, I'm gonna ask you to stand up. Come on up. So I'm gonna read a little bit about Terry for those of you who don't know him. He's the esteemed director of Project Fighting Chance and he stands with an unwavering champion of the community for the city of San Bernardino. <laughs> His unyielding dedication to the youth of the city has manifested into transformative partnerships, not only with us, but with so many across the city and the county. Together, we've established a boxing gym that trains grounds for youth, positing, providing a positive outlet for mentorship and so much more. He's got a business-oriented approach that makes sure that we have sustainability, and he's got so many initiatives. Every time I meet with him, I'm like, oh my God, I have a 20-year plan with Terry. Um, the roots of Project Fighting Chance goes back to 1999. However, in Terry's words, when you talk about him, he says, when you talk about P PTSD in the hood, it's here. And he made me learn so much about mental health that happens here in our city for our youth. His impact extends far beyond the confines of the gym, though. He actively participates and volunteers in the majority of our events. In fact, if you went to breakfast with Santa, it was the Project Fighting Chance team that was making all the breakfast items, including the yummiest pancakes I've ever had. And then more than that, he makes sure that he exposes participants to making sure that things that are covered, such as nutrition, mental health, sex trafficking, partner violence, civic engagement, and career development in his programs. Over the past year, the program has achieved notable success securing championships and adding new belts and gold to their already extensive trophy case. The highlight has been remarkable as we have seen the journey of Terrible Terry, a 19-year-old boxing phenom from here, the streets of San Bernardino, who who is gearing up for the Olympics in Paris. Since the inception of our partnership with Project Fighting Chance, the program has surged. Summer camp programs consistently host over 100 youth per day, while homework help and after school programs witness a steady increase of over 50 participants per day. In recognition of his outstanding volunteer service, his contributions to program development, and the creation of a positive impact in the city of San Bernardino, I am so proud, so honored, and humbled to give this award to my friend, Terry Boykins. Well, thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, we are humbled, as you know, that when these awards are presented, they are not for just one individual. There's an incredible team at Project Fighting Chance that just is able to get the job done. Um, day in, day out, you know, since we've been at Ruben Campos Community Center, it's been an incredible run. Uh, and in that run, of course, we've had the opportunity to continue our, uh, our pursuit of uh, accomplishment in amateur boxing, which uh, we have come home with nine-time national championship. We have brought that back to San Bernardino. Uh, we have just recently in Pasadena won the Golden Gloves uh, two weekends ago. And then, as you know, I think the, the, as soon as I walk in the door, they didn't ask where Terry was. They asked where Terry Washington was. And, and I said, I hope he is in Colorado Springs, Colorado, <laughs> training with the rest of the USA Boxing uh, Olympic team. And I think he's getting ready to uh, head to Italy. I believe he's going to be representing the United States and right here from San Bernardino. But one of the things that I think is very important, and that is how we get our job done in this community. If we do our job, if we do our job, today's troubled youth will be tomorrow's successful resident in San Bernardino. If we do our job. If we do not do our job, we will have failed a generation. And so, On a separate occasion, I will be presenting the state of the organization information to the mayor and the city council 
of what Project Fighting Chance has accomplished since it has been housed at Ruben Campos Community Center since January 18th, 2023. What I can tell you, one of the things I'm very proud of is the work that Liddy and I have had the opportunity to do, and I also want to give my shout out to her team, which I've had a chance to work with quite a bit last year, uh, and facilities management, which has kept that facility going uh, when things are needed. Uh, they have been there to make sure that when we open up at 2 o'clock and are ready to serve those kids in San Bernardino, uh, things are taken care of. And so, Manny and your team, I appreciate you. Um, in 2023, we logged 1,542 program hours. We are open approximately 30 hours a week serving youth on the west side of San Bernardino. And I can tell you, when these young people compete and travel around the United States, the respect <laughs> that they bring home to San Bernardino. In fact, these champions are from an after school program at a Parks and Recreation Center that have beat the best in the United States. That's what San Bernardino has done with Project Fighting Chance. Thank you. Can you come up to the stage so we'll take a quick sure. picture with the entire council? Thank you. Liddy? Thank you, Liddy. Thank you again, Project Fighting Chance. Terry, thank you so much for all that you do for our community. Moving on to a city manager update. Jeff Kraus. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I don't know if I can top that or even equal that uh, the good news and the positive things happening in San Bernardino just continue and continue and continue. Uh, the first item that I have is another bit of good news. Uh, there have been rumors going around for a few months that we have a major business coming to town and we can now confirm that coming to Orange Show Road is Tesla. Yes. So uh, Tesla will be building a 30,000 square foot service and collision center. They will be bringing 90 employees on two shifts here. Uh, it is the only service center in the Inland Empire, the closest others being in Santa Monica and Aliso Viejo. No, there, there's, a, there's a showroom in Riverside, but not a service center. Um, anyway, so we, we are extremely pleased that, uh, that Tesla is coming to San Bernardino. Uh, they will be starting construction very soon and expect to be open in 2025. 
Uh, last week, we also celebrated the grand reopening of the Residence Inn on Harriman Place. This is the first remodel of the Residence Inn in 12 years. They spent $3 million upgrading every room and the amenities for their guests, so we are very pleased uh, and excited with the wonderful f facility right across the street from Sam's Club here in San Bernardino. This Friday is, is opening day for the Inland Empire 66ers. Uh, we are excited that there is new ownership coming, uh, new ownership now in place for the Inland Empire 66ers. As of last week, the Diamond Baseball Holdings, who have a significant uh, presence in minor league baseball, are the new owners of uh, the 66ers. They promised to bring more events to the San Manuel Stadium. Uh, while that's wonderful news, we are sorry to see Elmore Sports Group uh, uh, sell the team. Uh, they had a, a death among the leadership and the family. Uh, but uh, they owned the 66ers here in San Bernardino for over 30 years. So we're very grateful for their partnership and sorry to see them go. Uh, but we welcome Diamond Baseball Holdings to San Bernardino and go 66ers. Bernie and the entire team will be there on Friday night. Uh, and uh, we're glad to see baseball is back. Uh, we are sending a mural and artwork depicting local native plants and flowers to our sister city in Goyang, South Korea, as a goodwill gesture celebrating our 21st year of a sister city partnership. Uh, the display will go to the International Horticulture uh, uh, in Goyang, which is considered to be South Korea's premier international flower exhibition. And the mural and artwork was created by local artist Christian, the mural was created by local artist Christian Mariscal, and the vases were created by Gonzalo de la Cruz. Anytime you say, guess what, I've got a 120 mile run for you to do, you say no thanks, but our PD really stepped up. They dominated at the recent Baker to Las Vegas run. Uh, 120 miles. They faced a 30 mile crosswind, an uphill route with a thousand foot elevation gain, and running at night with temperatures near freezing. The exciting thing is the team placed first in the 500 international division. They beat the second place team, the Riverside PD, by almost an hour. Overall, SBPD placed 12th overall out of 258 teams, which included elite teams from across the country. So to SBPD, congratulations on your best finish ever. And all of the team runners wanted to thank all of the volunteers and support staff who helped make their run possible. Congratulations, it's wonderful. And while we're still talking about good news, the San Bernardino Parks and Recreation social media program was recognized recently uh, by Next Practice Partners. Out of the 258 largest cities with a population over 100,000 in the United States, the Parks and Recreation Department was ranked 43rd in the nation, but more impressively, 10th most in post interactions, and number 16 for their Instagram account. So congratulations to the Parks and Rec folks. And lastly, I wanted to congratulate once again the Cal State San Bernardino basketball team. They reached the final four in the uh, NCAA Division II tournament, uh, the national semifinals. Uh, however, they lost in the final four, in, uh, but uh, they finished the season 27 and eight. They claimed their third consecutive league cha uh, title championship, their second straight Western Regional Championship, and this was their second consecutive trip to the Final Four. So the Coyotes really shine this year on the, on the hardwood court, and congratulations to the coaches and the players. And with that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. At this time, public comments will be heard for items on the agenda, on the open session agenda, and items not on the agenda. To address the city council, everyone must complete a speaker card and provide it to the city clerk. Only those speaker cards turned into the city clerk will be allowed to address the city council. No late cards will be accepted. Each person should state their name for the record. If, you're, if you require Spanish interpretation, we do have an interpreter on site. 
Please raise your hand at this time to indicate you will need translation assistance. In addition, we have interpreting listening devices available in the back. En este momento, se escucharán los comentarios públicos. Para dirigirse al Consejo Municipal, cada individuo debe completar una tarjeta de orador. Se debe completar la tarjeta de orador y entregarla a la Secretaría Municipal en este momento. Solo aquellas tarjetas de orador entregadas a la Secretaría Municipal podrán dirigirse al Consejo Municipal. No se aceptarán tarjetas tardías. Cada persona debe indicar su nombre para el registro a las 5 de la tarde. Pasaremos a las audiencias públicas y completaremos el resto de los comentarios públicos después de cerrar la última audiencia pública. Si necesita interpretación en español, tenemos un intérprete presente. Por favor, levante la mano en este momento para indicar que requiere servicios. También tenemos aparatos disponibles para escuchar la junta en español. Si no recibimos solicitud para los servicios de interpretación antes de las nueve, el intérprete se retirará. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. We have 15 speakers tonight. Each speaker will have three minutes. Madam City Clerk. The following speakers, if you can please make your way to the podium, Al Palazzo, Leslie Del Pozo, Jody Brown, Rochelle Hernandez, Tiffany Stafford, Sylvia Rios, Griselda Padron, and Dolores Armstead. Please state your name. My name is Al Palazzo, Mayor, Council Members, and City Manager. I understand that the position that I applied for has been filled. I wasn't even given an opportunity to be interviewed. I'm disappointed. But I want to be positive. Someday, I hope you will find a place for me to share my ideas. When Rancho Cucamonga built Victoria Gardens, they were thinking of a small town village like Claremont. They ended up with narrow sidewalks that are not big enough for a downtown. The paseos through the main square are small because when the small train passes the outdoor restaurant sitting areas, pedestrians have to step aside and make room. When they celebrate their birthday, the marching bands have to split to pass the medium on a narrow two-lane street. There are no real promenades that even a small downtown should have. Already in 20 years, one-story buildings have been torn down on the south side to be replaced with buildings that look two-story, to have two-story display windows with mannequins as downtown buildings should be. To misquote Kevin Hart, I'm not talking about sidewalks. We are not talking about practice. It is not a game. Seriously. I am talking about the relationship of downtown buildings with proper pedestrian spaces. You have to know the difference of different types of commercial buildings, the implications and the consequences. And if I had a seat at your table, I could give you a lot of detail. Build a downtown like Victoria Gardens, not a community center like Citrus Plaza in Redlands or Terra Vista in Rancho Cucamonga. We could do some of that on our other main commercial streets. They are big box commercial retail buildings better suited for other locations. I wish I had more time in the coming weeks, I would like to talk about architecture, public square, and other ideas. But as long as I'm only given three minutes, you'll never hear the thousand ideas that I have for a thousand blocks. This week, I will be 75 years old. For 50 years, I've been trying to reach out to the dais. I wish you would give me a place at your table. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Rochelle Hernandez. Hello, Mayor and City Council. My name is Rochelle Hernandez. I am a member of the social work program at Cal State San Bernardino. We are deeply concerned about our community's homelessness and hunger issues. It is imperative to take action to address these pressing issues. We plan to organize a feeding event at the end of April to provide meals for 50 needy individuals. However, we understand that this is a small step towards elevating the more significant problem. We want to discuss how we can work together to implement suitable so solutions to support the homeless population and combat hunger in San Bernardino. Your guidance and support in this endeavor would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Hi, Tiffany Stafford. Um, Councilman and uh, Mayor, we part of, we all part of the same group, so it's a group of us, so it might sound like we're saying some of the same stuff, so I'm going to just make it real brief. Um, the homelessness rate went up uh, since last year about 26%, so we can't solve the problem in one day, but if we can provide them with like bags of toiletries and and feed them and shoes and clothes for the day that we're trying to feed the 50 between Arrowhead and 5th. So we're gonna go to one of the parks and set everything up and we just come in here looking for support from everybody to you know, support our group and our project of what we're trying to do part of our class. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Jody Brown. So, hello, Mayor and City Council members. Um, as my classmates have said, we are in the bachelor's program at Cal State San Bernardino, and we know that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, homelessness and food insecurity uh, was an issue. I was wondering if perhaps there were any plans to implement a localized community garden that could help to provide fresh food, uh, fruits and vegetables, while allowing those in the area to benefit not only um, from the produce, but to be involved within their community as well. Um, also, I was wondering if it would be possible to allow the students from uh, CSUSB, uh, the social work program, and others to partner with the County of uh, San Bernardino during events like the probation outreach uh, that tra uh, travels to the different uh, cities to be able to give back to the community by providing us with laptops and Wi-Fi access while on site to help ensure the available resources, uh, hours, and address locations are known to those in need, along with trying to assist with any paperwork um, that may need to be filled out for those services. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Griselda Padron. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. As members of the Social Work Program at Cal State San Bernardino, we are committed to helping the homeless community and creating solutions through collaborative efforts. Homeless is a significant concern for our members because it exposes individuals to serious health risk and makes it challenging to receive food assistance and access to health care. People of all ages fall into homeless and it is essential to inform them of the resources that are available to them. Although San Bernardino has many resources that are available, many do not know their location or fear these facilities. Um, as said before, we are planning to feed 50 people and we are hoping that you will be able to support us, whether it can be funding to expand our feed, providing us with resources such as brochures or connecting us to different providers. Having this information with us at our feeding event will have many benefits. The people in need will be able to see what is available and utilize these services, resulting in fewer homeless people in the community. If different departments join us this day, there will be more information to give and if possible, receive assistance. For example, if a medical group could join, the people in need could receive a meal and at the same time get a checkup on their health. We may be able to connect them to various shelters, substance abuse programs, or crisis centers. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, my name is Leslie Doposo, and as my team mentioned, we come from Cal State San Bernardino, and our goal is to help the homeless population in the city. Um, we are here about the increasing homeless population in our city of San Bernardino. As you are aware, homelessness is a complex issue that requires immediate attention and effective strategies for resolution. 
The presence of homelessness not only affects the individuals experiencing it, but also impacts the overall well-being and image of our city. It is crucial that we address this issue with compassion, empathy, and a commitment to finding suitable solutions. We need to expand access to support services such as shelters, mental health resources, substance abuse treatment, and job training programs. These services can provide vital assistance to individuals experiencing homelessness and help them transition to stable housing and employment. With that, we can implement in initiatives to increase the ability of affordable housing options, which is essential for preventing and reducing homelessness. This can involve partnering with developers, nonprofits, and community organizations to create affordable housing units and rental assistance programs. It is important to recognize the homelessness is often the result of various factors, including poverty, unemployment, lack of affordable housing, mental illness, and substance abuse. We want to address these underlying issues through targeted interventions, policy changes, and community support to prevent and reduce homelessness in the long term. Thank you for your attention to this important matter. I look forward to working together to create positive change and improve the lives of those experiencing homelessness in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Good afternoon, my name is Sylvia Rios. To conclude this, um, esteemed mayor, mayor and honorable members of the city council, we urge your attention to the urgent matters of homelessness and hunger plaguing the residents of San Bernardino. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Want to turn on the mic, please? Thank you. Dolores Armstead, red flag on item number eight. He missed you guys. Item number eight is the city wants to establish a nonprofit to support opening and operation of a business and visitor center. Doesn't the Chamber of Commerce already do that? Why don't we support the Chamber of Commerce? Why are we establishing a nonprofit? Your explanation didn't make sense, I read it. The initial cost is $2,000, and then it'll be 2,000 annually. That doesn't make sense. If any of you know anything about budgeting, nonprofits, that does not make sense. So where, where did you get your uh, numbers from? That doesn't cover phones, printing, personnel, tours, etc. So who came up with that magic number? Plus, it's coming out of the city's general fund. That's my tax dollars. And you don't even make sense with the numbers you came up with. Where is the budget? Where is the analysis? There is none. Somebody came up with a great idea. Who's paying the initial staffing? What location? The chamber already does this. Why don't you support the chamber? How transparent will this agency be? Look at page 120. The California Public Records Act is already being ignored by your four times fired for corruption city manager. So do we expect something better? And they're going to appoint current and future elected officials to the foundation's board, big red flag, especially if it involves the mayor and the left side. So please, somebody, get some common sense and look at this. It doesn't make sense. Support the Chamber of Commerce who's already doing this. Then, San Bernardino, People, please stay vigilant. You see what they're doing. This is a red flag. What are they really up to? Is this something your four times fired for corruption city manager came up with? Somebody came up with a way to make money. Not. We're going to be ripped off again. Um, also, we're going to see more uh, warehouses and car washes. We already have 30 car washes. Why do we need more car washes? We, this city is the laughing stock of the state. What is the status of Oxbow? When is the city going to address the issue? How many years has it been and you've done nothing? Another year, more toxins, people continue to get sick. The left side of the dais isn't doing anything. I guess your residents aren't paying you enough. But wait, you have a developer coming on that side of town who's going to build 900 homes. Guess what's getting ready to happen, y'all? People be vigilant. You see what's happening. Red flag, especially for this, these council members. Red flag, thank you. And he missed you all. Thank you. Say yes. Next speaker, please state your name. 
Good evening. Good evening. I am Prophet Dominic Antunes. Um, I wanted to talk about the rave that happened on March 22nd weekend. I was out there and I was preaching and talking to people and listening to some of the things they had to say. And I saw some appalling things. And it wasn't just the women that were dressed scantily. No, it wasn't just that. But it was the rampant drug abuse. Okay? People that are walking all along E Street, they're walking down Mill, they're going down Arrowhead, and going down Central. People are smoking pot. People were selling mushroom bars. And it doesn't take a police officer undercover to go out there and notice what's going on. All you got to do is walk out there and you see it. And people are openly drinking alcohol. And all this, they're doing this right in front of the police. They're not doing nothing. They're breaking all these penal codes. Right? So why are... Why is this still happening? You know, there's drug abuses, there's, there's um, overdoses. I can't tell you how many times I saw ambulances with their sirens on and the lights flashing. They were going into that area to help people. And I saw this one guy, he was walking around, he was on Mill Street by Arrowhead, and he was selling pot out of a little wagon. I mean, how far does this got to go? People are dying over there. And so I heard about a, an event that was going on last year. The 17-year-old girl, she thought she was getting cocaine, but no, it was laced with fentanyl. And that's what they're doing these days. They're lacing them with fentanyl, which comes through the cartels from Mexico or wherever, and China is selling it to them. And they distribute it out here and all over probably all around the world, but it's here in the United States. And now I wanted to tell you this. I just read an article, a part of it, that you could read online from CBS, dated from November 14th, 2011. The city of San Bernardino was looking to make profits off of this. That's not a lie. For entertainment, for tourism, and building up. Now, how does that feel to you? Everybody here that's listening, how does that feel to know that people are dying, people are overdosing? How's that a war against drugs? You tell me. I, you know, I, I call on the families, the friends, and the parents of those who've lost loved ones to all these overdoses. Or, and the 17-year-old girl that was getting that cocaine Thank laced you. with fentanyl, guess what? Thank you. She was brain dead. Thank you. Thank you. Madam City Clerk. The next speakers are Dominic A., Jim Mulvihill, Albert Hopkins, Lydia Savala, Treasure Ortiz, Mike Hartley, and Georgia Lacaretzos. Good evening, Jim Mulvihill. Uh, the comments I have deal with agenda items 10 and 11. Both of them are table D of the program implement, implementation status of the uh, housing element. Both are exactly the same word for word. But let me read to you some of the uh, status <coughs> of the issues. The city adopted a new vision for the groundwork for the da future downtown specific plan. And that was program 3.1.1. Then on program 3.1.3, .3, the city did not update the development code. The city has postponed due to the Im impending update of the general plan. And lastly, that I'm going to point out, is that program 3.4.2, the city is currently working on a comprehensive update of the development code and has begun a work on a new general plan, which is anticipated to be completed by 2023-2024. Now, I believe that the Citizens Advisory Committees for both the General Plan Update Committee and the Downtown Specific Plan Committee haven't met in over a year. 
And I'm just assuming that the, uh, the, the development of the, the downtown specific plan and the general plan is no longer active and no longer moving forward. I encourage you to reactivate these committees and allow them to complete, complete their duties. Not just because staff has used them to support their annual housing progress report, but also because of the structure and guidance provided by these plans will improve the chances for quality development in the city. By the way, the downtown specific plan was virtually finished when its meetings were suspended. Please don't throw away the work that's already been accomplished and the millions of dollars that have already been spent. Both of these documents set forth feasible end results or goals for the city and the downtown specifically. They are developed through a dialogue that begins after the provision of an analysis of relevant data and includes the public, city decision makers, development interests, and other stakeholders. It's important to have this public dialogue. It helps validate the need for, the feasibility of, and achievability of those future city and future downtown projects. It's the very definition of inclusion and transparency. And there are written documents that should become a continuing focus for development proposals, even as mayors, councils, and city managers change over time. Being public statements, these plans provide the public, general public with information regarding their community, providing, improving their ability to understand and participate in their city government. Citizen participation. Thank you. Is a good idea. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker. Yes, good afternoon, uh, city council, Mary Tran, uh, Albert Hopkins. I'm a resident here in San Bernardino. I'm in Ward 1. Um, I had a couple of things I wanted to speak on. Our streets. Uh, we allotted funds to get our streets repaired. Uh, I'm not seeing it quick enough. I mean, there's major potholes throughout San Bernardino. Uh, especially, there's one right on Baseline and Waterman. Uh, actually, Waterman needs to be paved all the way up to, from 40th down to hospitality. It's that raggedy of a street. And that's not just, as there's several of them locations throughout San Bernardino that need to be addressed. Um, also, um, I came home a couple of weeks ago and the street was dark. The whole block, all the way down Sierra Way, was dark on a Sunday evening where the week before it was bright and sunny, you know what I mean? There's lighting there, okay? Um, some things that we need to address in our city to make it better. We have buildings, we have companies coming here, but we're looking raggedy still. You don't understand? Uh, my vehicle, I'm traveling, I, I just got a new vehicle. My other one, though, uh, I brought it to your attention before that I had a warped rim behind hitting a pothole, okay? Uh, the other issue is our homelessness. I walk, me and Pastor Reginald, uh, Reggie Thomas, every Tuesday, every Wednesday and Friday up at Paris Hills Park. And we've watched the progression over a period of time. And now, I was just there today, this morning with him, and we walked. And it's gotten even more worse than what it is. The police come through. We saw them cruise through the park, OK? But yet and still, you've got major homelessness there. You know what I mean? And it's deterring people from coming out to the parks. Our park and recreation, I appreciate what we've done. They're doing an excellent job. I know Juanita and everybody, I'm one of the business owners that you know comes out, me and my wife, we support. Uh, Juanita always gets in touch with us and we come out and we do what we can and enjoy ourselves and are trying to build up San Bernardino. But some of the things that's going on in the parks and recreation areas, we need to address a lot sooner. Okay, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much for your time. God bless. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Lydia Savala, Animal Services. I'm going to read to you a text message I received last Thursday from one of your um, constituents 
um, I'm not sure which ward, uh, living on 5th Street near Mount Vernon. The text, I'm going to read it to you in Spanish and then I'll translate it. El shelter sigue sin aceptar mis pedros y donde vivo ya no los puedo tener. Uh, this, the translation is that uh, the shelter continues to not accept uh, my dogs. And where I am living, I am no longer able to keep them because of her landlord. And in the last three weeks, I've received three calls from your constituents requesting my assistance, which I do. I provide them, I go to their home, I photograph the dogs, I put them on five, six different uh, adoption websites, um, I schedule appointments, I screen applicants, and I ensure that the dogs are spayed in, or neutered, vaccinated, microchipped, uh, and dewormed. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware the, the shelter has the right to decline dogs from owners, and I'm sure it's done for a lack of space, public pushback, it would ruin the stats. But what ends up happening is that these dogs end up on the street abandoned and they're dumped because they have, they have risk eviction. It's either them or, you know, or the dogs. Uh, female dogs end up, you know, pregnant unbeknownst to a kind strange, uh, the kind stranger who rescued them and a full service veterinarian um, for moral reasons will not spay a pregnant dog. So I have an admission to make. When I started coming here, I, I, my perception was that the problem in the city is attributable to your constituents, but now I feel quite differently and that the city bears some responsibility. Uh, Dr. Phil, the uh, psychologist and author writes that when there's a problem and you come to the table to discuss that problem, everyone needs to consider what they're doing to contribute to that problem. Um, and it's easy to say it's a national problem, which it is, I understand that, and that it's all cities across the country have this problem, but we're not like other cities. We have the second highest poverty level in the United States, second only to Detroit for cities with populations over 200,000. And we are also different in that we have that $1.1 million grant from the Band of Indians for that spay neuter vehicle, which still has no veterinarian. There needs to be a plan created, an alternate plan, because referring people to the Humane Society is not a solution. I don't consider them low cost. So I suggest we do something to stop the flow, use the money for the purpose it was intended, or give it back. Thank you. Next speaker. Mike Hartley. Now, as you guys know, I'm pretty much a critic of code enforcement. And I think it may be unfair to say all of code enforcement is bad because we do have officers that give their best and one of them I want to give a shout out to and that's Joshua Stringer. He has done a lot to help me clean up some blight around the city. He replies to all my emails. He takes care of problems. I'm not saying he goes out of turn. These are old cases, some of them a couple years old. Uh, but San Bernardino has had a blight problem for many years. And I've been in San Bernardino since 1958. Now, I was a kid, but I can tell you, even as a kid, I thought some things just don't make sense. And one of them was the corner of Linwood Drive and Golden Avenue. On each one of those corners, there was a gas station. So we had four gas stations, basically, in a, in a uh, residential area. None of those gas stations are there anymore. They're basically blight. And when I see now we have Circle K's being built back in San Bernardino, I can look at all the old Circle K's that turned into blight when they left town. What makes me really nervous is a parent company that owns Valero owns Circle K's. And some of those Valeros are right by Circle K's. So eventually what's going to happen is we'll probably have a lot of Valeros turn into blight for the city of San Bernardino. Just my opinion. 
I mean, you can do your own homework, but I do believe it's all under the same parent company. And I hope we don't run into the same problem that we ran into before. And I'm sure a lot of it is just to grab tax dollars. But eventually it ends up costing us in the end. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Georgia. Um, hello, Mayor and City Council. Over the past six years, I have been involved with helping to address the animal companion crisis in our city. Six years. I've been overwhelmed like many others, which led me to, which led me to come here to all of you starting last year. Um, I now believe the core issue lies in a lack of communication and connection between the city and the residents, rather than just a cultural indifference to this crisis. To address these challenges, it is crucial that we support community engagement and promoting transparency. Neighborhood association meetings and commissions should serve as platforms for community members to contribute their perspectives and become part of the solution. Many residents are unaware of these opportunities due to a lack of visibility and promotion, including myself. We still have vacant seats and expired seats on these commissions. Instead of blaming the community for our problems, we should empower them to become part of the solution. Commissioners play a vital role in representing the needs of our communities and bridging the gap between residents and the city. Improving voter turnout and community engagement through these types of outreach initiatives make it essential for the city's progress. Essential resources like free TNR on Wednesdays and low cost spay neutering options should be promoted at city events on the animal services page and the city website. A significant portion of our community speaks Spanish. Translating all communications into Spanish and consideration of direct outreach to households without internet or social media access is important for effective communication and engagement. By fostering better communication, com communication, enhancing community engagement, and improving outreach efforts, we can work together to address and make a significant impact on the companion animal crisis and create a more connected and supportive community for all of our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, is there any more speakers? No, that's it. Thank you. We will now move on to public hearings. We actually have one public hearing, item number six. Public hearing on annexation number 37 to Community Facilities District 2019-1, Ward 3. Good evening, oh. Mayor, City Council. Uh, we do have Spicer Consulting Group uh, oh. present this evening to give a presentation. Can I just mention that it is, the hearing's now open at 6.16 p.m.? If, if the Mayor and City Council would like the presentation, Spicer Consulting Group is on site. Yes. Yes. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Shane Spicer, Spicer Consulting, here to present the item for the public hearing of Annexation Number 37 to the CFD 2019-1. Okay. So the recommended action is for the public hearing to be held in regards to the Annexation Number 37 into CFD 2019-1, hold the public hearing adopt a resolution calling the election, hold a special election, and adopt a resolution declaring the election results. Upon approval of the preceding resolutions, introduce, read by title only, and adopt the ordinance. 
amending ordinance number MC-1522. So the public hearing is for CFD 2019-1 annexation number 37. Property owner MV RE Holdings has requested the city assist them in annexing territory into CFD 2019-1 to cover costs associated with maintenance of public improvements. This project was to include 12 detached single family residents ranging from 1,689 to 1,706 square feet with attached two car garages on 12 individual lots. And this development was fully approved in June 8, 2021. The area proposed includes annexation 37 includes 12 individual parcels. And on February 21st, the council adopted resolution 2024-030, the resolution of attention and to hold the public hearing tonight, April 3rd, 2024. Okay. The services to be included are to fund those services that are included for the maintenance of median landscaping, other public improvements, public lighting, including street lights and traffic signals, maintenance of streets, pavement management, street sweeping, maintenance operation of water quality improvements, storm drainage, and flood protection facilities. In addition to these costs, the foregoing services are also to collect proceeds to fund administrative expenses and collect for reserves. This is the location of the project in question. It's located on the northeast corner of Mill Street and Macy Street within the third ward. And the fiscal impact is that at build out, the anticipated total special taxes to be received for maintenance costs is $8,471 and the total cost of the annexation is borne by the developer, and there is no fiscal impact to the city's general fund. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. We will now receive comments, protests, and questions from any persons in the audience who wish to speak on this matter. Each person may address the city council for a maximum of three minutes. Please submit your speaker slip to the city clerk. We do not have any public comments. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Um, are there any persons registered to vote within annexation number 37 of community facilities district number 2019-1? If so, how many registered voters are there? Mayor, just for the record, we also did not receive any written protest. Okay. And the County of San Bernardino Registrar of Voters has certified that there are no registered voters within annexation number 37 of community facilities district number 2019-1. Thank you. I now declare the public hearing closed, the time being 6.20 p.m. Do I have a motion to adopt resolution 2024-063 for annexation number 37? Make a motion. Second. Councilman Ribarra, motion. Seconded by Councilmember Sanchez. Second. Madam City Clerk, please okay. call for the votes. We'll take voice votes for these items. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank the you. Official, May I have a motion? Oh. The official ballot has been opened and all votes are in favor of the proposition presented on the ballot and the election is now closed. Thank you. May I have a motion to adopt resolution 2024-06444 and annexation 37? Second. There's a motion and a second. Madam City Clerk? Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Councilmember Kelvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I would now ask for a motion to waive further reading and introduce by this title only an ordinance MC1634. Is there a motion? So moved. There's a motion and a second. Madam City Clerk? Okay. So ordinance number MC1634, amending ordinance number MC1522, and levying special taxes to be collected during fiscal year 2023-2024 to pay the annual cost of the maintenance and servicing of landscaping, lighting, water quality improvements, graffiti, streets, street sweeping, parks and trail maintenance, a reserve fund for capital replacement and administrative expenses with respect to the City of San Bernardino Community Facilities District number 2019-1 Maintenance Services. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. 
Councilmember Kelvin? Yes. Councilmember Alexander? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to, to discussion items. Number seven, City of San Bernardino Parks Master Update Plan. Can we begin with staff's presentation? Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Very excited to bring forward a master plan update today. Uh, before I introduce our uh, consultants and guests, I want to make sure to remind you all that this is not a discussion on what's happening with our CIP projects. We plan on bringing our updates for our CIP projects. This is simply to discuss the updates of the master plan and our survey findings. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Neil Bat and Doug Grove. All right, good evening, everybody. It's a tough act to follow with all these awards that Fox and Rec and Community Services keeps winning today, so this is a good time to be here. Liddy asked me to keep this short, so I promise I'll be done by 10 o'clock. <laughs> Just kidding, wanted to see that you're paying attention. My name is Neil Ibhat. I'm the founder and CEO of Next Practice Partners. We're based in Indianapolis. We do this all over the country, six continents, you know, all over the place with national award-winning agencies. And we have a hyper-local partner with Doug Grove and RHA that's based in Riverside as well. The same PD that San Bernardino beat by one hour, that same city, that's right where he is. Uh, but so we're happy to share the findings. As Liddy said, uh, you know, right here, last year we kicked off uh, the community input process as well, one of the most inclusive ones I've seen, where for the first time I actually saw people applaud in sign language during a master plan public meeting. So some really cool stuff with English, Spanish, sign language all happening at the same time. But before we get into that, I want to share some quick findings for what we've seen with park access, demographic profiles, and future trends with the city, and then we'll get into what the community has to say. So Trust for Public Land, National Rec and Park Association, and the Urban Land Institute create this focus on a 10-minute walk access. I know, Mayor, when we spoke about it, you said that's one of your priorities. You really want to emphasize equity of access. Where we are right now is at about 46%, which means more than one in two people in the city currently do not have access to a park within a 10-minute walk. Nationally, it's in the higher 50%, so that's certainly an area to look at as well. Using Esri Environmental Systems Research Institute, as well as census data, we ran population projections. The only accurate number anybody has is 2020. Everything else is just an estimate. And since the pandemic, a lot of those numbers can change. But based on some projections, as you can see here, over the next 10 to 15 years, the city is projected to continue growing in population. More importantly, rapidly diversifying as well. If you look at the chart on the left-hand side, that's where you can see a significant drop in what the census calls white-only population and a combination of an increasing diversification of some other race, two or more races as well. Hispanic and Latino is an ethnicity. That's why you see the chart on the right. They could be part of any of the races. And we see that going forward, three in four people in the city will be uh, identifying from an ethnicity standpoint as Hispanic or Latino. A lot of impact in terms of recreation preferences by different race and ethnic groups, how we communicate, what kind of offerings, what kind of spaces you design. Uh, the department's done a tremendous job in creating opportunities for the community to come together around special events as well, celebration of cultures, the other Los Muertos, like you saw. Those are the kinds of things that we're going to continue seeing more of as the community diversifies. From an age segment, you're still a very, very young population. Even as you age, I refuse to call them seniors. They do not behave like it. It's very much an active adult population, the 55 plus. And we're seeing this nationally that the 75 plus recreates very differently than the 55 to 74. So how do you create more walkable opportunities between the 10 minute walk access to more trails, to safe places to go to and recreate is key. At the same time, 54% of the population in the future is projected to still be young families with kids. So how are we going to plan for a multi-generational and intergenerational experience? Along with events, it's also recreation spaces, facilities, et cetera, that are going to be really, really important. The tough part with all of this, someone's going to have to pay for it. And you know this part as well from a socioeconomic standpoint. 
we serve a lot of people who are not as fortunate. From a median income standpoint, that's the midpoint of all households uh, and every person over the age of 16 living under the same roof, we are much lower than state and national averages. From a per capita standpoint as well, just case in point, $20,000 is what an individual earns on average in the city compared to 44000 in California and 40000 nationally. So even compared to national averages, we're much lower as well. Access, in many cases, to parks and recreation might be the only type of recreation many of the community members and their households may even have here. So with those things in mind, that's where the Parks Master Plan and its outcomes came about. How do we ensure equity of access? How do we ensure trends are incorporated in what's going on as well? Ten years ago, Doug and I were doing the first master plan, or the, the master plan in Carlsbad, California, and for the first time we had people show up with a bunch of paddles. And I had no idea what that was. In ten years, it is the fastest growing sport in the country, pickleball. Uh, so who knows what the next ten years will bring as well. Selfishly, I hope that's cricket, but I'm not sure that's what's going to happen. So what are those trends that we look forward to as well? At the same time, uh, Liddy and the team have embarked on an inspirational and aspirational goal of getting national accreditation, that's CAPRA, Commissioner for the Accreditation of Park and Recreation Agencies. You're already winning statewide and national awards, but CAPRA, which is a series of 150 plus standards of a high functioning, high performing outcome based agency, is currently awarded and acknowledged for less than 210 agencies out of 12,000. The number of agencies in California that have CAPRA accreditation, less than the fingers on one hand right now. That's the elite group this department is working towards, and one of the key components of that is a parks master plan that is adopted by the council. So this is a huge step in working towards that as well with the vision, mission, values, the CIP, the short, mid-term, long-term goals. But all of that begins with your community's values. We don't want to be the ones from the outside coming in telling any community what's best for them. We want to ensure the community's values drive what the outcome and the recommendations are. I've met a number of you as well in one-on-one -on -one interviews, a lot of department staff, leadership, all the parks and recreation community services staff, and a number of different community focus groups, uh, which I'm going to share in a moment here. So as we talk about the discovery process, just some quick highlights. In keeping with sort of the digital space as well, we have an ADA accessible, multilingual and 80 plus languages and a mobile friendly website for this master plan called mysbparks.com. As we go through the plan, all the updates, all the meetings, everything is out here as well. For all those in the audience, please bookmark this website. Keep going back to it. Survey findings, future opportunities to contribute, everything is going to be here so that at the end of this process, you see the plan develop in front of you in a transparent, objective way, so that by the end, there are no surprises, and no one should come back to council and say, I didn't get a chance to participate in the process. This is available 24-7, this year, 366 days, uh, in a mobile-friendly way for everybody in any language they want as well. Some of the other pieces we did, and this is where you can see a number of different places. We got a tour of the Boxing Ring and Project Fighting Chance, one of the absolute coolest initiatives I've seen in my 20 years of doing this all over the world. I'm actually going to be in Paris for the Olympics, and I was telling Liddy, I can get access to boxing tickets. I just want to know the weight class, and I will be there to support Team San Bernardino in Paris as well if I can. Uh, but a lot, a lot of these, we got to tour the sites, we got to meet the staff, we had stakeholder interviews and inclusion audits as well, looking both from neurodivergence and linguistic access, sign language, Spanish, etc. And then one of my all-time favorite interactions, uh, I know, uh, <laughs> Councilman Campbell, you were there as well, uh, my young friend came up with an entire plan for a park, drawn, walked on stage, spoke and shelled his heart. I said, dude, you can take my job now. Like, you're already set for it. Uh, but that's the passion. We had so many youth show up. We had, again, young professionals, young at heart folks all show up because they care, because this matters to them, because this is about their future. And what we want to do ensure is that when you plan the future of the city of San Bernardino, 
that the future themselves has a say in it. That's why we've gone out of our way to ensure more of these inclusive avenues as well. And then we toured the sites. Doug's gonna share in more detail uh, the assessments as well, both the good and the not so good, right? And as we saw this as well, none of these are surprises to you. You know that as well. But these are things we wanna be talking about. All of this, of course, is subjective, right? This was a function of who showed up at all these meetings, what we saw as a part of our assessment. All that, though, was then transferred into a statistically valid survey instrument through a national firm called ETC Institute. This is the only tool we have that ensures that the sampling of who responds mirrors the demographics of the city from an age, race, ethnicity standpoint, gender standpoint as well, so that it actually becomes a representative sample of your constituents. And I only half joke about this because if you don't have a medium like this, and all you do is public meetings and 100 people like me show up, you better believe the most important thing in San Bernardino is cricket fields. And that's not true, but that's all you're gonna hear, bless you, which is why you need a representative scientific random sampling. That's what this firm did. They sent out a few thousand surveys throughout the city, mailed with an option for a follow-up for a phone, as well as an online link that is one per household. Did anybody here get a mail survey? You did, did you take it? Okay, well thank you then, so now we know. Uh, so I wanna share some of these key findings, but really important here, our goal for statistical reliability was 400. We got about 5% higher than that, 419 responses. The last bullet really means that for statistical validity, you have to be able to repeat the process over and over again and get consistent results. What this tells me is 95 out of 100 times, the results you're about to see are in a margin of error of plus or minus 4.8%. That is what makes it statistically reliable. An important piece, if you see all the spectrums here, we asked respondents to rate and share the ages of people in their household. It's unlikely to have a 16-year-old take a six-page survey. That's typically not gonna happen, but I wanna ensure that people responding are thinking of all age groups. And you can see here that the household includes people that are under five and over 75 as they were taking the survey as well. So some key things here, as you think about responses as well, the left chart talks about visitation to parks and rec facilities. We had about 60% say they have visited in the last 12 months. Nationally, the average is about 80%. So we are certainly lower compared to national averages. And at the same time, the chart on the right talks about the condition. And this is where a majority of them rated as poor or fair. Almost 70% said that the condition was poor or fair. We'll get into some of the reasons why as you look in the subsequent charts. We talked about barriers, right? What prevents households from visiting parks, centers, aquatic facilities more often? I've done about three or 400 of these. This is probably the highest response for lack of safety that I've found, right? Almost three in four, four people said they didn't feel safe going there. This is at a point in time, done a few months ago as well, right? So this is, it's, it's previous to the injunction. I don't know again how perception would change at this point as well, but that's what they talk about, tied to criminal activity, tied to lack of maintenance and restrooms not open. And we know all of those are very much interconnected, right? It's not for staff's lack of effort. It's not for y'all wanting to do the right thing and, and sort of focus on this, but that's what is stopping people, kids, families today from feeling safe or going to the parks. In terms of who all and what organizations they use as well, uh, one in three people, and they had multiple choices, so one in three people said they go to neighboring jurisdictions based on, again, what are the kinds of amenities they'd wanna have, followed by coming to us and public schools. Those were the top three places that they went to. And in terms of program participation, uh, again, better as well. We're slightly lower than national averages, which is about 32%. We're still in the 20s. But that's also a shift because two years ago, you weren't offering any programs, right? So going from absolutely nothing to your events, starting to bring people back, that's tremendous progress. I would challenge and guarantee that if you did it now, that number would be even higher. And at the same time, you have far fewer people rating your programs as poor. 
right? They are in the spectrum of fair, good, to a few excellent as well. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to offer the programs, staff and the city are doing a tremendous job. People appreciate it, they participate in it. More of them just need to feel safe coming to them to continue offering, and you need to have enough staffing to be able to continue offering those programs. So a big challenge as well in terms of why people aren't participating in the programs, number one reason 47% said, I don't know what is offered, right? This is one of the top three reasons across the country. And as you saw in the social media rankings report as well, you're actually doing a really good job getting the word out, <clears throat> but it's also a matter of just the amount of noise that is in people's lives, right? I call these weapons of mass distraction. Uh, between Netflix, Hulu, Disney Pluses, and everything else people have, there is so much more competing for people's time, money, and dollars right now, that if we don't have the right kind of spaces to provide those kinds of experiences, it's gonna be harder for us to keep getting people there as well. So investing in more marketing, more resources and communication. I've seen nationally a dollar spent in parks and recreation marketing brings in anywhere from seven to $11 in return on investment because of increased participation. It's not an expense, it's an investment. We just need to do better of continuing to tell the story to more and more people. So then we said, okay, great. If you had to invest the dollars, where would you want to spend the money? So we asked them for 100 bucks. Number one reason, 31 cents out of every dollar they wanted to spend on increasing safety and security measures. And you know, I, you know, I, I, I talked to Liddy earlier and you mentioned about doing a citywide uh, through the PD as well, the security camera deployment. I think that's a great aspect. It's something that the community is heavily supporting. So I commend you all on moving in that direction as well. But it's also looking at increased fencing, security guards, more eyes, and activation of the spaces, right? If you have people, you have more eyes, people tend to feel more safe. Following that, 21% or 21 cents is tied to more improvements. So really, half of all spending, they really want to focus on improve what you have and ensure that what you do have is better maintained, safe and secure for people to want to go to. Now these are the really key pieces as well. We talked about how important it is for the city to provide high quality parks, facilities, programs. More than four in five people think it is very, very important. Uh, this is something we've seen in the last three years as well across every political spectrum. Parks, recreation, community services are deemed more and more as essential and not a nice to have services. These are key to quality of life so the next question we said, okay, great, you think it's important, would you be willing to put your money where your mouth is? That ultimately is the key question. And despite the socioeconomics of the community, this was really, really encouraging. A majority, two thirds of them said they'd be willing to pay anywhere from three to $4 more per family per month to invest in the kinds of parks, recreation improvements, offerings that they want for their households. This, folks, is huge. Again, it's a point in time, I recognize that, you have to do more, but for something like this in a community that is financially strapped to say they're willing to pay more money, tells you how much they value this. These aren't just park advocates, these are users, non-users, all ages, race, and ethnicity. This is a representation of every constituent in the city sharing this as well. And the same thing they think from the city standpoint as well, the majority of them, 66%, want to increase funding to parks, rec, and community services. 3% said reduce. 22 times as many people said increase funding to parks, rec, and community services as a way to help increase quality of life, address community challenges, et cetera. So the top five reasons and areas of concern, no surprises, I know you all know this, homelessness and panhandling, blight, community safety, crime, violence, were the top three with over 58% cited for each of them as the biggest concerns, followed by sufficient neighborhood amenities, economic development, and ample safe places for kids to play as the next three.
So you can see a lot of this comes down to improving safety security measures, greater activation, eyes on the park as well. And the last culmination of the survey results was taking all of these facility amenity needs and putting them in a priority for investment. This comes straight from the statistically valid survey data. Neither staff nor we can influence it, but it's based on a combination of what is important to people, what is a need that they say they have, and from that, what is an unmet need? And in all my years of doing this, we've always done this as three ways, high, medium, and low priority. In this case, for the first time, there is no low priority. Everything that they shared was either a high or a medium priority only. What just goes to show the community has a lot of unmet needs. Some of the ones, I know you're already working on the parks as well. Doug will speak to that in terms of ratings, but I know in, in your improvements and park plans to things that you've got going on, as you can see here, trails, safety lighting, walking paths, community parks, community center, small neighborhood parks, picnic areas, playgrounds, so on and so forth, are all very high priorities. So as we think for the future as well, I wanna have Doug share a little bit more on the assessments that they've done, and we'll wrap up with some of the next steps. Thanks, Neely. Um, I do have a personal connection with San Marino. My daughter played at Cal State San Marino on the national championship team five years ago, so I was glad to see the men are doing great as well. So. Um, so we, we analyzed all 39 parks that you have, uh, six of the, the six pool facilities and the nine recreation facilities. So you see them all listed there. Um, we looked through every park with a, a GIS device. So every element, um, as you move over to the next page, um, has been documented on what is in the park, um, its condition. Um, this is all data we'll turn over to the city for their maintenance uh, plan and for other elements as part of our plan. Um, we then looked at uh, all of the parks, um, rated them between a, a zero to one, which is poor, to a four to five, which is great. Uh, we look at it in four different categories, access and connectivity, uh, condition and functionality, safety and comfort, and maintenance. So those all get scored individually for each park. Um, and then you look at the next page. I should probably fast forward. This would be helpful. Everybody else can see it. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so this is all of your parks. This is all 39 facilities. Uh, we rated them into three different areas, a low assessment score, basically zero to uh, 1.5, a moderate score, one five to about 2.5, and then a high assessment score over 2.5. Um, about 75% um, of the parks are in the low to moderate score. 7% uh, are in the highest rating. Um, so this is lower than, than, than normal. Um, but the really great news I have tonight, for sure, is that three of the parks are in the bottom 46%. Uh, Nicholson, Second Lake, and uh, Guadalupe Field are all uh, in construction drawings now. And actually, Nicholson is getting started in construction. So we're not talking about CIP tonight, but we've got three parks that are in that area that are actually going to be improved here in the next couple of years, which is exciting to see. Um, aquatics needs assessment, we have our specialist uh, aquatic design group come and look at all of the, par uh, the pools. Um, two of them, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at it down here, it's my fault. Uh, two of them are the Jerry Lewis Swim Center uh, and the CID pool, obviously operational. The four that are not operational, Hernandez, Delman Heights, and Canto Pool, and the Nunez Pool. Uh, they did a very thorough evaluation. We can give you more details on that, that later. But the summary basically came to um, they need repairs to continue to serve safely and effectively, significant costs required to rectify code maintenance items, uh, additional dollars needed to modernize or update. Uh, rising construction costs make the total cost of bringing all the facilities back pretty unrealistic. Um, we might want to consider consolidating the number of city aquatic facilities to focus on newer and fewer and reduce operating costs and provide residents a better experience. So we'll be bringing more of that to you later. We also analyzed all nine facilities, building facilities, and we'll be updating you with that in the next meeting, talk about the condition of those and what we can do there. So I will wrap it up and let Neelay finish up. So just the last couple of things here. You know, as we start now looking at developing your level of service, this is what we were talking with Lydia and the team earlier. We're gonna be quantifying all the inventory based on what Doug and his team have assessed of every asset amenity type within the system and complementing that with not just the city, but also the county or the school district and other similar providers. So we have an understanding of what the community currently has access to. 
What Doug and his team have done is looking at quality. This will look at quantity. And then once we determine what a recommended level of service is, we will then develop equity mapping for access. And these are a couple of examples as well. The one on the left is from Chino. The one from right is from Fremont. But you can see based on the service area rings where you have overlaps on the left for basketball courts, for example, and the other one is pickleball courts where you have gaps. So we will be mapping every amenity uh, based on the providers, based on the service areas, so then as the city is deciding for future development as well, not only are you prioritizing what the greatest needs are, you're also prioritizing where they need to go to maximize equity of access to the most underserved in the community. That's going to help inform the action plan, the vision, and the funding and revenue strategies for what implementation looks like. And those are the things we'll be coming back to you in the next few months as well, with level of service, equity mapping, what does staffing look like as well to ensure that as these new sites come on board, as new programs are offered, do we have adequate support internally to keep up with the growth as well, to keep elevating the level of experience, and ultimately the vision and action plan. So all this is in the next five to six months to continue coming back to you with the findings, ultimately the draft and the final recommendations for your adoption. So with that, we'll happen to open up questions and any conversations you may have. Thank you. Do any members of the council wish, wish to discuss this item or have any comments? Oh, council member Alexander followed by council member Calvin. Yeah. Followed by council member Ibarra. Welcome, Mealy, to San Bernardino again, and I just want to say thank you. I know that this report has taken a lot of time and energy from all of Park and Rec staff that have assisted you and all of the meetings that you held throughout the city. Those were some important meetings, and I was happy to be able to attend in multiple uh, wards to be able to hear what the people of San Bernardino um, want within their, like, within walking distance, right, of their homes, and particularly when we're trying to build uh, new housing. Um, I know that that is one of the first things that if you're a young family or, you know, that they're going to be looking for, right? Good schools, good parks, and all the other amenities that people want when they're looking for to, to purchase a home in a city. So I thank you guys so much for all the detailed information, and I can't wait for Nicholson to get started shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Alexander? Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for this fine report, and thank you for listening to our, our residents and with that survey. I really do appreciate it. And since uh, Tesla is coming to San Bernardino um, and thinking ahead, because you said it more than one time, do you think that uh, solar canopies in our parking lots, in our parks, or, so, or chargers is something that we should be looking ahead to do? Because 10 to 15 percent of all cars sold in, sub in California are now EV cars. So is that something that you guys are looking at to put in our parks, solar canopies, and charging stations in our park? Because the school district already put solar canopies in their parking lots, and our parking lots are a lot larger than theirs. What do you think? I am not an expert on solar panels to speak to that. Uh, I will leave that to the experts as they design the parks to think about it. Part of the plans, this is a system-wide plan, right? So the implementation is going to be looking at what makes the most sense, both in terms of energy efficient, water efficient as well, and access and design principles. So I don't know, Doug, if you have any answers for that, if you want to share. I think it would definitely be a site-by-site -site analysis, depending on who's using the park, how often the cars are there, um, and the cost. Because the cost of those is pretty expensive. Um, so it, as, as we get into the more of the CIP, which is the next step, we'll incorporate that into the CIP plan if it makes sense for those parks. So it'll definitely be a discussion item. But I think it is a good idea to think about. Right. You gotta, if you're thinking about tomorrow, then let's really think about tomorrow and do what's right for those residents who drive those type of vehicles. If you're going to be in the park a couple of hours, you can charge your car and, and, do, and, and go forth that way. So please, think ahead. I know the city of Lancaster, probably about 10 years ago, did their whole parking lot, and they power about 85% of their building with that solar power. So it is very doable. Right, it is. So please keep that, Ms. Liddy, city manager. Okay. Thank you, council member. Council member Barra? Hello, gentlemen. Thank you for the report. And if I'm n not mistaken, you guys were also at the first fiesta at Second Lake Park, right? Okay, I filled out the survey. <laughs> I was not sure. Um, thank you for the report. Um, now I I'd like to ask our city manager if it's possible, um, slide number 22 on page 11. 
So the, the, the public has already said if they had $100, where would they want their money spent, correct? And now, if we can do a comparison to the actual funding we have approved for those uh, different areas, is uh, question 15. It would be good to show the public how much of those $100 we have allocated to those um, issues they were pointing out to the parks uh, when determining for the CIPs. Um, I, there's a lot of funding we've approved for park repairs, uh, park programming, for example, and it'd be nice to have that side by side. So if you have somebody in your staff that can bring everybody in, I know it's multi-departments that are working together, police, public works, um, and parks. For example, it, it'd be nice to just show a side by side of how we're doing and where we need to put more money into. Mayor Kelsabaro, yeah, absolutely. We'll bring that forward. Thank you. Good that questions. Any further questions from council members? I don't see none. This is the receive and file, so there's no votes required, right? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Big round of applause for our presentation. Thank you. We would now move uh, on to consent calendar items 8 to 19. Are there any polls? Oh. Councilmember um, Calvin? 8, 10, and 11. Seeing no for other polls, do I have a motion to? I'll move the balance. The balance, thank you. Mayor Patel. And there's a second. Can we do a voice vote? Okay, voice vote. So we're pulling, uh, there's a poll for 8, 10, 11, and remaining balance. Councilmember Sanchez? Yes. Councilmember Ibarra? Yes. Councilmember Figueroa? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Councilmember Calvin? Yes. And Councilmember Alexander is out. Thank you, Councilmember Alexander. <laughs> Council, thank you. Councilmember Calvin? Thank you. For number eight? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. So if you could, Mr. Elliott, give us a breakdown of how this operation is to begin. I do have some questions. Uh, when I read it, it does talk about a welcoming center, but yet I'm looking at it, and when I uh, saw it before, um, that it was regarding uh, a nonprofit public benefit. I don't. Actually, I, I, actually um, I'm out of mayor, uh, council member Calvin. I am. Uh, item 10 and 11. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so what was your question, Councilmember? Kelsey? So my question is, is, it does not match up to me either. I do not know why um, it would be con called a nonprofit public benefit corporation when this item originally, it, it, it appeared that there was going to be a way for nonprofits to be able to benefit, and then now it's look, looking like it is a welcoming center for the city of San Bernardino, and as the constituent mentioned before, that is what the chamber does. So I'm not, and then my second issue is that uh, there's no community members that are gonna be sitting on this board, and I think that if it is a um, board that is going to be pr uh, benefiting nonprofits, that it definitely should have multiple uh, community members that are sitting on here to help govern and for transparency reasons. Mayor, Council, Council Member Calvin. Uh, this was never intended to benefit nonprofits. This is to allow uh, basically uh, promotions, uh, funding provided by the business community in order for the city to communicate and provide special events for the city 
Uh, this was never meant for nonprofits to benefit from this what, whatsoever. What type of events for the city? This would be the state of the city events. This would be any communication events that the city puts on that we would have sponsorships uh, that would be inclusive of the business community. And so this, then it's not nonprofit. It is then, so it's not a nonprofit public benefit. It is a for-profit benefit. That would mean then the businesses are the ones that are going to be giving the $2,000. They're going to be putting in who's actually depositing into this fund. Profit business, business for profit or nonprofits? Council, Council Member Calvin, um, whoever wishes to uh, provide funding to the city, they're welcome to, whether they're nonprofit or for profit businesses. We don't, we're not going to exclude that. This is a 501c3, therefore, it is a not for profit. Uh, but we're taking in funding, right? We're taking in funding in order to uh, support activities throughout the city, whether you're a nonprofit or a, a or for-profit business. You're saying then equally, everybody's gonna be able to be a recipient? Uh, who's going to, who then? Uh, Council Member Calvin, I've never said anybody's a recipient. The recipient here is the city. When the city provides special events, uh, such as the state of the city, in order to provide those events and we're not using general fund, that's what this is for. So is the chamber a partner in this? The chamber is not a partner in it. We will, the city will be communicating its own message moving forward. The responsibility of the staff and myself is to the city, not to the Chamber of Commerce. So why would we, are we, so you said a welcoming center. So I don't understand then why then the chamber wouldn't be part of the welcoming center. The, the chamber is not uh, responsible at this point in time for business retention, expansion, and attraction. The staff and economic development, myself, are, and that's what this purpose is for. So why is it that we don't have any community members that are part of this board? Uh, Council Member Calvin, we have not put forth the members for this board yet. And who, who are meant, the, uh, the board members that are mentioned, who are they? Who would they be? So the board members that are mentioned, uh, we will be looking forward also to bring those to council and have, council, uh, have a council member on this board as well. One council member, how many board members, period, in entirety? City we manager, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me. I just wanted to go ahead and add that in the staff report, it does indicate that the, the board will be made up of elected officials from the city, uh, local business owners, and members of the community. So I just wanted to clarify that, that it is mentioned in there. It, per the bylaws, you can have members a minimum of nine up to 13, and that would be appointed by the city. Okay, and so we don't have a breakdown as to how many community members, how many elected officials, and how many city staff members? Mayor, Council, we do not at this point in time. Council Member Calvin, I will be coming forth to Council uh, requesting those. So then how come we can't have this as a discussion versus a cons on the consent calendar? We have not. Uh, this is establishing the 501c3. We do have an event coming up for the sponsorships, which will be um, for the state of the city so that sponsorships can be provided. The city, uh, the staff will become forth to council uh, to get appointments on here. Mr. Councilman Alexander is asking who appoints. So then why can't we have this as, as a discussion item and then you bring it back when it's ready to go? This is complete. It is ready to go other than the appointments. Other than the appointments, but you're, saying, you're making it seem like we're preparing it for a necessary, uh, an event that we're getting ready to do. We are. But we don't have, but we don't have the breakdown of the electeds, the uh, community members. We don't have this information just yet. So we're making some decisions right now, but it was, so it's really not fully ready to go. No, it is complete. This is complete. This is the complete So then program. how come we don't have this information then? Because I have not who come the to comprises, council. Who comprises I it? I have not come to council and requested those board positions as of yet. I will go to the mayor and ask the mayor, since she does appoint those with the permission of the council, in order to do that. Well, then I'm going to request that we bring this back, motion that we bring this back, then once you've had that conversation with the mayor, and then we can all be voting on it in its entirety as to the breakdown of the body, of, of this governing body that is going to be doing business on behalf of the city of San Bernardino. Mayor, Council, Council Member Calvin, I would not recommend that at this time since we are receiving sponsorships now for the state of the city, which is going to be occurring at the end of May. So then we're putting the cart before the horse. No, this program is complete. No, it sounds like it sounds like you're putting the cart before the horse. If you have to come back and have further discussion as to the breakdown, and I think the breakdown of the board is essential that the community also knows the breakdown of the board. That is that is that's really essential. We should have that information. 
Mayor. And again, I motion that we bring this back so that you can tell us how this commission is going to be actually governed and Mayor. by who. Mayor, Council, this is not a commission. This is a 501c3, much like the 501c3. It's a board. It's a board. Much like the 501c3 for parks and animal services. Got it. It's so a this board. Will be the same way. It's a board, and there's going to be board members. We need to know who those board members are going to be, but you have not decided that yet. You said there still needs to be a conversation. We can bring that back so that the community is, will be involved or informed as to the makeup of this board. We will come back with a recommendation to the mayor to make those appointments. When will that come back? I'll have that ready for you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. One, we'll do one quick, There's a, a, I have a. I have a question. Councilmember Sorry. Alexander. Sorry. Thank you. Who who appoints the initial board and is the and who's the chairman and how is that going to be? Is that in there too, uh, Emily? Yes, it's out, actually outlined in the uh, bylaws that they are appointed by the city, and it stipulates. The terms. Appointed by the city or appointed by the council? Well, by the city means the council. It would have to be appointed by the mayor and then procedurally. So the mayor okay. appoints all appointees and ratified by the council? Correct. Or it's not one per, one per council no. member and then the rest by the mayor? Mayor, council, it will be recommendations will be made to the mayor and the mayor will make the appointments with the approval of the council. The recommendations will be ma made to the mayor? Staff will make recommendations to the mayor of who we believe should be on that committee because there are certain community members. So the council does not have any input on who gets on this nonprofit? Mayor, council, if there are nine board members, there are not nine council members. So the council, other than ratification, has no input on who gets on here? Other than ratification, they have no input who gets on here? We will request from the council. I also have recommendations that I will make to the mayor, and the mayor can make those appointments and bring it to council for consideration. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Sanchez? Move to approve. There's actually a, was there original was motion? Original second to the motion? Okay, so th there's a motion second to. Uh, the for that, to prove the item. Councilman Marie Barra? Yes, uh, and I think uh, what my colleagues from the 6th and 7th Ward want to find out is, yes, it's, it's good that we're going to start this, but who is going to lead it in the meantime, since you are already preparing for another event to get funded? Who is going to oversee that money that's coming in and going out into the community to fundraise? Uh, uh, council Member Barra, Council Mayor, Council, Council Member Barra. So, this will establish the 501c3 to take in the funding. Okay? The purpose of the board is to ensure that the funding is being spent appropriately. Correct. So once we receive the, we don't plan on spending it until the board gets uh, available. But okay, we will now, be. I used to also be part of a, a 501c3s, mm -hmm. and I know that before they start, they have to have a board when they apply mm -hmm. to the state and the counties. That's, that's why we're, we're asking those questions. Yeah. So, so if you had read the staff report, you would see in the staff report that identifies um, the positions. We're not naming people. Like when you guys name people to your commissions, you say, we want, you know, Jose Garcia to serve. We want Mr. Smith to serve. They identify the positions so that your bylaws would identify the positions to be determined. Like, I don't know, the city manager, two council members, the president of the chamber of commerce, or two business leaders. So just, I hope there's not confusion because I keep hearing people say, well, who is it going to be? We don't know, it could change. And we don't name city manager Montoya because maybe in 10 years, city manager Montoya is not gonna be here. You want the city manager to be there. So th that's the way you form nonprofits. You identify the mm -hmm. positions mm -hmm. who will represent the people who will be on the board. Yeah, yeah that wasn't my question. Or Council it wasn't, member, you have Sorry about that. In, a, in addition to what uh, uh, Ms. Sonia had said is also at the same time, there'll be staffing, and it'll be myself, it'll probably be Josh, there'll be staffing that on behalf of the board. Thank you. Councilmember Calvin? So I was just going to clear up that it wasn't that I was looking for names. I'm looking for positions because I do operate a board as well, uh, op operate a nonprofit. So I'm looking for the positions and who is going to be appointing 
the positions, who are going to be appointing the people to those positions is what the breakdown is. Because we all know how many votes or how many names, people that the mayor gets to appoint to different commissions and how many each of us get to appoint. I'm looking for the breakdown as to who gets to appoint to this board. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Please call for the votes. I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor. When will we gonna have that information back? Mayor, Council, my, uh, my plan is to get that back to you in two weeks. Thank you. At hopefully by the 17th meeting. I believe it's the 17th. Councilmember Kelvin and Alexander waiting on your digital vote. My vote was no. It might, it's jumping out, thank you. Madam City Clerk, do you want to announce the votes? Last five to one with Council Member Calvin um, voting in opposition. Thank you. Uh, next poll is item number 10, Council Member Calvin. Thank you, Mayor. And so we can just uh, bundle the 10 and 11 together. I'm probably yeah. sure that you thought that as well. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to do, definitely reflect on what former Council Member Moby Hill stated. Um, you weren't here. But that general, the general plan and the downtown redevelopment, those commissions have not met in well over a year. And I find it uh, that this item to be on the consent calendar to be a little disturbing because I think that that input and all of that information um, regarding those uh, codes uh, for the general plan and the downtown redevelopment do need to be, uh, do need to have, we do need to have some discussion with those uh, appointed or uh, board members, those commissioner members, I'm sorry. And so this is, I think that this definitely, what, you okay? I don't know who we're winking at. Oh. Mayor, Council Member Calvin, if I may, this is the third time you all have seen this in the last two months. Uh, the first time was with Miss Mary Lanier, and this is the final for both of these items. This is the final one. Question was made tonight regarding those commissions um, that have not met and the information that was provided during those meetings and why haven't those commissions right. met to be able to review all of the work that they did bring forward in order to bring us to this, this point. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, council member Calvin, I can answer that question for you. Uh, what you have in front of you this evening is just the, up, uh, the update on progress report for the housing element. It has nothing to do with, with the general plan itself. Typically, when uh, a city undergoes uh, a general plan update, we have an advisory committee and we have community meetings and so on and so forth. That is still going to happen, but we are mandated by the 1st of April of every year to make a report of the progress specifically for the housing element. Um, it just so happens that uh, we are bringing this forward to you for both 2022 and 2023, which is totally separate from uh, the, the general plan update itself, which would be coming forward uh, because the consultant is still working on it. So at that time, all the community meetings and so on and so forth, uh, you know, we would, we would have meetings and things of that nature. So do we know when the general plan is going to be brought forward, at least an update? Mr. City Manager, I believe that you gave us a time frame, but we have not gotten an update on the general plan. 
Mayor, Council, Councilmember Calvin, uh, Mr. Gabriel and I have been talking about that. It should be a few months, no more. Um, we have to come back to Council one more time, uh, but there have been a number of updates to the plan that the city had made uh, that we need to finish off now, but that plan should be done in a couple months. Can the council receive an update as to where we actually are currently? Mayor, Councilmember Calvin, I just informed you that it's complete in a two months. It'll be done. The it's entire complete. Plan. Yes, the entire general plan. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Alexander? Yeah, like former Councilmember Mobile said, why don't the commissions meet? I, I've asked that question before. They haven't met in over a year, and he's right. Is there any reason why? I can take that question. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Alexander, I, I think the reason has been that uh, the general plan update process itself has encountered so many challenges. The consulting firm working on this is also working on specific plan and, and the housing element and, and some other I, and a zoning code update as well. So there's a lot of inundation. The other aspect of this is that we've had so much turnover at the director's position for the department. So overseeing all the coordination of, of the uh, different groups and having charrettes and things of that nature have kind of fallen to the wayside, but we're gonna revive that. Uh, I know there has been some community uh, outreach. I think we have done, according to the consultant, 17 community outreach uh, programs have been have been done over over uh, since the since the process began. So uh, there have been information received from the community groups that have been incorporated into. That, into that's the not my question, I, and okay. I appreciate you saying that, mm -hmm. but that's not an answer to my question. Mm -hmm. My question is that I've been asked, and I don't know about other council members in America, but my my commissioners have asked time and time again, mm -hmm. why don't we meet? And uh, you answered part of my question was mm -hmm. that there's been different turnovers in staff. That I understand. Mm -hmm. that, that I understand, and that's what I share with my commissioners. Mm -hmm. But now that you're here, mm -hmm. and you said it fell by the wayside, which, is, which I didn't want to hear, but I understand that, right. okay? I, I do understand that. So when are we gonna get back on the horse? We are going to get back on the horse. When are we going to get back on the horse? I would have to, I'm going to, uh, I have a call placed to the consultant tomorrow. Are we going to get the latest update on the plan itself? I know there's some uh, budget augmentation that is also involved in the process. Mm -hmm. And that is necessary because of all the uh, heavy lifting that they had to do in, in absence of city staff actually managing the project. So those, when those things are cleared up, mm -hmm. I think we'll have a clearer picture of how we can bring things to the Planning Commission for, for recommendation uh, to the City Council. So when are the commissions going to meet? Uh, we haven't scheduled anything specifically for the Planning Commission for the month of April or Not the May. Planning Commission. Uh, okay. I mean, you mean the commissions? Uh, yes, sir. The, the groups? Uh, yes, sir. So, so Mayor, let, Council Member Callum, yes, if sir. I may. Once the report is complete, we'll go ahead and initiate any commission meetings that we need to have. But until that report's complete, there's no point. We're gonna start paying more and more money until the consultant can get the report done. So right. you're not gonna meet with the, com the commissions because until the plans can meet, aren't they supposed to be involved? Aren't the, isn't that the whole point of the commissions or for the people to be involved? Council Member Alexander, the commissions have been involved throughout the process the last six to eight months. They have been, the place works has been doing the work absent the staff that we have not had. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it has not changed the direction from any of the commissions. So therefore, when the, when the general plan is complete here in a few months, we'll take it back to the commissions for review. That's kind of where we're at now. It would be a draft, basically. We'll have a draft that was gonna go through, uh, you know, the commissions and the committees for additional recommendation, and then we parcel everything together, which would uh, constitute a final document, which would come. Do you see what the problem is here? I see some of it. Because the commissions and the people on those commissions that serve voluntarily, mm -hmm. which I don't know if you guys care about that, but they serve voluntarily mm -hmm. and they ask and they care about the community and then when they don't hear anything from the city, because I have no answers for them, 
then there's there's always a there's an issue there. Right. I agree. Councilmember Alexander, our concern is we're trying to get the plan done, I, I and if that. we continue taking it back to the commissions and changing it, it's never going to get done. So we need to get a draft document completed first. That's our priority right now. So their input and changing of the document is more important. No, they've yeah. already been consulted. When the plan goes back to them, it'll be a draft report for them to review. At that point in time, if they have other considerations to make, we'll take that into consideration as we move to finalize the report. However, doing it midstream again, it's going to take longer to get that report complete. We need to finish out the general report. We're, we're still working with PlaceWorks? I'm sorry? We're still working with PlaceWorks? Yes, we are. We cannot change them at this point in time. There's, it'd be moot. We cannot do that. Yeah, that's what I thought. And, yeah. and just for the public's... Um, Council member? Uh, oh, I want to just clarify, we're Council just Marie trying to... Um, let's allow Council Mary Alexander. You're done? Okay. Council Mary Barra. Yes, I just want to clarify. We are here to approve the housing element progress reports from 2022 and 2023, which is what staff had been working diligently on the past few months. It has come before us. That's all we're here to approve. If you are going to talk about commissioners meeting, that is something that we all need to bring, uh, and we have, I know I have, to our city manager, but that is not part of this discussion currently. I just want to make that clear for us, what we're doing tonight. Thank you. Council Member Sanchez? I couldn't have said it better. That's exactly right. Um, so move to approve. There's actually already a motion second. by Mayor Pro Tem, and second, second by, okay. There's Call a the motion question. second. The voting is open on your screen. Is this for, uh, both for 10 and 11 or just 10 first? Yeah, can we do this just to both? Both together? There's a motion for both? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, uh, can we take that as a slate? Um, Thank you. Yeah. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That concludes our consent item. Moving forward, uh, moving on to Mayor and City Council updates. Council Member Sanchez? Yes, uh, so this is a shout out to um, Gian Torkin. He's a local developer here in the city. He has worked tirelessly for years uh, along with staff to get our 5th Street corridor east of the 215 freeway uh, revamped. Uh, and now we're having an event April 11th from 12 to 2, which is the culmination of all that hard work. And it's a celebration of of the city's success and Gion's success in getting that corridor and revi uh, that corridor revitalized. Uh, the address is 796 West 5th Street, and it's the uh, the grand opening for the Del Taco, uh, the Starbucks. Uh, there's another business I'm missing, isn't there? Isn't there a gas station? There's something. There's plenty. You'll you can miss it. Del Taco, Starbucks. Uh, 7-Eleven, um, in and outs expanding their, their parking lot. <laughs> That's all. It all looks good. Whenever we have new construction like that, it looks all spruced up, and it shows that the, the city is turning the corner, and, and we're taking back our city one, one, uh, one block at a time. And uh, so, again, April 11th from 12 to 2, you'll see him. He's a, he's a dashing uh, older gentleman, but uh, dashing nonetheless. Gian, when you see him there, shake his hand, pat him on the back. He's, uh, he has worked, again, tirelessly to get this project done. He's a champion of the city, and we all owe him a, a debt of gratitude. So thanks, Gian. Thanks, city staff. I'll be there, and I hope everyone else is as well. <coughs> thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Barra? Yes, thank you. Uh, on March 27th, I was invited by the, our uh, San Marino Area Chamber of Commerce to attend a soiree ribbon-cutting event um, in the second ward. Uh, we have a new dentist in the second ward, Dr. Philip Tagatak, and I hope I did justice to his last name. A young gentleman, very um, professional and welcoming, which is something that we need as, as uh, people that need to get our teeth checked, that we, we are gonna be treated with lots of care and attention. Um, so if you're looking for a new dentist, there, um, he's located at 2015 North Waterman Avenue, Suite B. Um, the place is called the Inland Dental Arts. Um, so please, um, if, if you uh, want to call them, their phone number is 909-713-2077. Maybe your insurance covers for those services. Um, so we're welcoming him in. Um, 
Also, at that same meeting, I was approached by a member from San Marino Valley College. Uh, if you're an alumni from San Marino Valley College, they are offering free membership signups currently. So it, I know I was, I, I was a college graduate, and usually to join these associations, you have to pay a fee. So right now, they're offering free memberships. If you graduate from San Marino Col Valley College, please join the alumni association that they have for free, and it's for a limited time only. You can contact them via phone, 909-384-4471. You can visit their website and sign up at www.sbvcalumni.org. Or you can go in person over at Valley College. It'll be on the second floor of the Campus Center. And of course, once again, just visit their website, sb sbvcalumni.org. And um, other than that, I've been going to um, a lot of the continuum of care, homelessness meetings that, um, that are going on. We are trying to uh, push forward some funding for our homeless providers in the region. Um, I've been very vocal still uh, telling other elected officials that are sit on those boards to get the word out that if they know any nonprofits with beds and shelters to please notify 211 so they can update their system. Uh, we are having a problem that our city did uh, improve on our shelter beds available. However, other cities are claiming they don't have any beds. So when they call 211, they get referred to our city uh, for sheltering. And that is a, a huge concern because homelessness does not only affect our city of San Marino, you know, it affects everybody nationwide. Um, having just gone to Washington, D.C., they also have the same issues that we're facing. Just every city is different. Us as elected officials have approved as much funding and pro projects and programs collaborations as possible to address the situation, but when other cities are referring homeless into our city, it's not helping our, the, our currently unhoused population within our city, which is why we're having an exponential increase in, in encampments, and we all, we all see it, and uh, we're trying our best to address it on our end, and we ask that every other city around us does the same thing. Um, and other than that, that is all my updates I can provide at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Figueroa. Uh, thank you. I, I don't think I have any announcements, but I think in, um, you know what, I'll just, uh, I'll announce that uh, the National Orange Show in about two weeks, um, April 17th, will be having their grand opening that, that Wednesday through Sunday. So just encourage the public to go out there, you know, get on some rides, eat some food, you know, check out the petting zoo, and just have some fun. It's good family fun over there. That's all. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, none? Councilmember Calvin. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So of course, we gotta give another shout out to that good old Park and Rec Department and everybody, Public Works, because we know that Lydia always shouts out everybody that helps to put on every single event. So thank you all so very much for all that you do, the wonderful awards and the presentation. Um, I wanna say uh, thank you to Dr. Gwendolyn Dowdy Rogers for working with our young women here in the city of San Bernardino through Young Women's Empowerment. I did attend their gala and it was um, magnificent always looking to continue to raise funds for those um, youth in our city. And there has been another senior group started. The Golden Age Group is happening every Tuesday, 10 to 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Acoma Unity Center, uh, inviting all of our seniors, Golden Age folks, as they would choose to be called, that are on the west side of San Bernardino. So you're welcome to attend 1367 North California Street. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Alexander? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, I did attend Young Women's Empowerment and Dr. Gwendolyn Rogers, and Councilmember Calvin was one of the recipients of the award there, so congratulations, Councilmember Calvin. I also attended the uh, Socialites 57th Annual Boutillion. Uh, those ladies in San Bernardino, if you guys don't know about the socialites, they gave out an astounding $43,000 in scholarships to young men in San Bernardino, to seven young men across the county. Seven got $43,000. They got laptops, they got luggage, they got trips. They really do a fantastic job at the socialites, and I was happy to attend. And the winner, and the winner is called a Sir Knight, and Sir Knight was Solomon Moore. He won. He, he received like $19,000 in scholarships that night. Outstanding job. Um, also, oh, th I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. And a happy Cinco de Mayo to everyone that's coming up, because I won't see you before then, so a happy Cinco de Mayo. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you.
Um, I just really want to give a shout out to the Parks Department for the extravaganza that occurred. And oh my goodness, so many kids came out. My own kids loved it. So many eggs. How many eggs? 40,000 eggs. It was, I mean, the kids were just running wild. So just want to say thank you for the families. They all had a blast, including mine. Um, on March 21st, I attended the League of California Cities Transportation, Communication, and Public Works Policy Committees. As I am, I sit on that committee, and I want to thank you, um, Public Works Director Lynn Merrill, for joining me to see what opportunities are there for us, uh, resources, grants, and so forth. So thank you so much. You know what I'm looking at? Um, I also participated on a call for California versus Hate, and I would love for our city to participate. United Against Hate Week, which takes place in September, something just really to, to bring our community united against hate. So that's something I would love for staff to kind of look into. I, I know there's resources that's there for us since I sat on that, and so there's tons of resources that we could just utilize and push that message out there. Um, and that's pretty much it for me. I just want to say thank you again to all of the staff, all of your hard work um, to continue to push uh, you know, progress in our city forward. Thank you. All right. We will adjourn the meeting, 7.28 p.m. The Mayor and City Council and the Mayor and City Council acting as the successor agency to the redevelopment agency will adjourn to the regular meeting to be held on April 17th, 2024 in the Feltheim uh, Central Library located at 555 West 6th Street, San Bernardino, California, 92401. Closed session will begin at 4 p.m. and open 